develop this new technique, which I believe he is going to say a, a little bit about today on imaging quantized vortices. And this is really made him very well known in the community and he's really currently way is one of the leaders in the quantum turbulence community. His research interests include quantum fluid dynamics, cryogenic heat and mass transfer, cavitation and bubble dynamics, cryogenic particle detector and accelerator physics. I forgot to mention that he has been at Florida State University from the summer of 2012. His work has been supported by uh, federal funding agencies such as the NSF, US Department of Energy, NASA, Army Research Office, as well as uh, various national labs and industrial partners. He is also the recipient of the JSBS Invitation Fellowship Award. Uh, with that way, I hand over the screen to you and we look forward to listening to your talk. Okay, um, thank you, Ambrish. Uh, can you still hear me? Can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Ah, okay, all right, so I'm going to get started. First, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers to invite me. It's my great pleasure to have this opportunity to discuss our research on uh, flow visualization study of fluid dynamics in superfluid helium. Um, so let me first uh, very briefly uh, introduce our group. Our cryogenics lab is located in Tallahassee, the capital of Florida State in the United States. And it is part of the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory. Uh, currently, we have a number of uh, PhD students, two postdocs, and a few undergraduate students. The work I'm going to present today uh, was done mainly by a few graduated students together with existing students like uh, Tosi Oki, uh, Mikai, and the postdoc, Dr. Bao and Dr. Tan. So here is the outline of my talk. In the first part, I will uh, discuss the motivation why we're interested in studying the fluid dynamics in liquid healing, especially in superfluid healing. I will tell you that liquid healing is actually a very useful material uh, for not only classical fluid dynamics research, but also because of its uh, very interesting quantum hydrodynamics in the superfluid phase. Uh, after that, I will discuss the flow visualization techniques that have been developed to liquid healing flow research over the past one or two decades. This include the particle imaging velocimetry and the particle tracking velocimetry technique using solidified uh, hydrogen tracer particles. And then I will also discuss the molecular tracking velocimetry technique developed in our group uh, using uh, tiny axmer molecules as the tracers. Uh, in the last part, I will very briefly mention uh, some ongoing work uh, uh, in developing uh, a novel particle tracking velocity technique using clouds of uh, axmer molecules as, as the traces. Those clouds are generated by a novel method, which is essentially neutron helium 3 reaction. Okay, uh, let me start with the motivation. Why we are interested in starting the hydrodynamics of liquid helium? It turns out that liquid helium is a very useful fluid material in turbulence research especially in the so-called high Reynolds number turbulence research. We know that many flows generated in nature, such as by large ships or airplanes, um, uh, those flows are typically turbulent. And then the uh, turbulent flow can be characterized by a dimensionless number called a Reynolds number. The Reynolds number is essentially defined as the uh, velocity, a characteristic of velocity, multiplied by the size of your system, and then divided by the fluid the kinematic viscosity. So for airplanes or large ships, the Reynolds number could be as high as 10 to the eighth to 10 to the ninth. It's highly desired to produce such uh, highly turbulent flows in laboratory for systematic research, so one can better design those ships and airplanes. But it's very challenging. It turns out that typical wind tunnel experiment with air and water can only reach Reynolds number of 10 to the six. This is uh, easily understandable because uh, in those experiments, uh, essentially the size of your system is limited. It cannot be as large as the actual airplane. So you have to scale it down. Uh, as a consequence, the Reynolds number is typically uh, much, much smaller, orders of magnitude smaller. On the other hand, uh, if you take a look at the uh, phase diagram for the helium 
there are three fluid phases. One is the uh, vapor phase. And then uh, at relatively high temperature, we have the regular normal liquid phase. We call it a heating one. And then at lower temperature, we have a superfluid phase, which we call it a healing two. Then both healing one and healing two, those two liquid phases, they have extremely small kinematic viscosity as compared with all other fluid materials. So uh, if you go back to the formula for this Reynolds number, you can see that if the kinematic viscosity is small, then it should be possible to generate high Reynolds number flows, even with flow facility uh, of limited size. So in our experiment, uh, in our lab, we have already demonstrated that uh, in healing two, liquid healing two uh, channel flow, uh, a Reynolds number as high as three times 10 to the seven can be readily achieved in our lab. So uh, this liquid is quite useful in high Reynolds number turbulence research. Also, uh, if you check the critical point of helium, it has a relatively small uh, critical pressure, which means we can easily access this uh, critical point. Then by manipulating the pressure and the temperature around this critical point, one can change the vapor density by orders of a magnitude. As a consequence, one can tune the kinematic viscosity of healing vapor by uh, over three, four orders of a magnitude. It turns out that helium vapor is a very useful material for uh, convective uh, heat transfer research. Okay. Um, what we are more interested in is indeed the uh, emerge interesting quantum hydrodynamics in the superfluid phase. So if we cool the helium to below about 2.2 K, uh, it undergoes a phase transition and enters the so-called superfluid state. In a superfluid phase, Phenomenologically, the liquid can be regarded as, uh, as consisting of two components. One is the superfluid component, which is the essentially the condensate part. We know that the bosonic healing atoms can be described by a wave packet. So if you lower the temperature, in the, uh, in the end, the wave packet of individual healing atoms can become strongly overlap, and as a consequence, both instant condensation can occur. Then the superfluid component is essentially the condensate part in, uh, the, in the liquid helium. And then at finite temperature, on top of the condensate, there could be thermal excitations, such as uh, phonons and rotons. So the collection of the quasi-particles can be regarded as a, a, a fluid component. We call it a normal fluid component. So the total density of this two-fluid system is the summation of the uh, density of the two fluid components. This total density does not change much with temperature, but the fraction of each component depends strongly on temperature. Uh, close to the phase transition point, we essentially have nearly 100% of the normal fluid component. But as the temperature is decreased, uh, as reduced to towards say one Kelvin or below, then the superfluid essentially dominates. Uh, essentially below one Kelvin, we have a pure superfluid system. Uh, both fluid components can have independent velocity field. The superfluid has no viscosity, no entropy, but normal fluid is pretty much like water. It has uh, viscosity and entropy. Um, the superfluid component has a lot of interesting quantum um, properties. For instance, uh, circulation in the superfluid component is quantized. If we rotate a cup of superfluid, uh, you, you, you cannot create a large uh, adjunct vortex uh, tube like this. In the end, what you will get is an array of quantized vortex lines. The reason for that is because the superfluid component uh, is described by a microscopic wave function, and its velocity is related to the gradient of the phase part of this wave function. As a consequence, if we integrate the velocity along a closed contour, which is the essentially the definition of the vorticity, one can easily derive that the vorticity must be quantized. It can be an integer multiplied by the Planck constant divided by the mass of the helium atom. Uh, in liquid helium, the quantum number n uh, takes the value of a one because of the energy, uh, because a uh, higher quantum number for vortices with a higher quantum number, the energy is too high. It uh, spontaneously split into single quantized vortices. So based on this quantized circulation, uh, 
uh, one can easily derive that away from a straight uh, vortex, uh, say at a distance r from the rotation axis, the velocity is given by this formula. It's proportional to one over the distance from the rotation axis. As a consequence, if one approaches the rotation axis, the velocity diverges because of this one over r uh, scaling. So to fix this divergency, uh, in the end, the superfluid density drops down to nearly zero in a very narrow core region. Uh, in superfluid helium, this core region has a diameter of, an order, of the order of one angstrom. So essentially, it's a tiny, uh, it's a very thin tube, which we call it uh, vortex lines. So in the end, when you rotate a cup of superfluid, you will get an array of those quantized vortices. Uh, due to the two fluid nature, turbulence can occur in both fluid components. Uh, in a superfluid component, essentially the turbulence is induced by a tangle of quantized vortices, and the motion of those vortices can be easily determined. It's essentially due to the induced flow plus background flow, uh, which, is, which can be calculated using the well-known Biot-Savart law. So to this end, uh, quantum turbulence uh, is essentially simpler to model than classical turbulence because we only need to know the position of the quantized vortex lines. Once you know the vortex line position, you can then compute the superfluid velocity at any point in three-dimensional space. Uh, turbulence in the normal fluid is more classical. However, those quartz particles, which you know made of the uh, normal fluid, those quartz particles can scatter off the quantized vortex lines and this scattering leads to a mutual friction between the normal fluid component and the superfluid component, which is given by this formula. This mutual friction uh, can cause a lot of very interesting peculiar behavior in both fluids, which I will talk about. So as far as the quantum hydrodynamics is concerned, uh, there are two temperature regions uh, that are of interest. One is uh, above one Kelvin, where we have both fluids coexist. Uh, in this region, there are two forms of flows uh, that have generated long-lasting interest in a quantum turbulence field. One is the so-called thermal counterflow. Uh, the thermal counterflow can be induced by a heat transfer in superfluid helium. So for instance, if we have a channel filled with superfluid helium, then if we turn a heater at the closed end, uh, instead of uh, classical convection, what will happen in the channel is that the normal fluid will carry the heat and then move away from the heater. At the meanwhile, the superfluid will move in the opposite direction to compensate the fluid mass. The superfluid will get heated up near the heater surface and then turn into uh, the normal fluid. Uh, the flow of speed of the normal fluid and superfluid are completely determined by the heat flux. This counterflow uh, heat transfer mode is extremely effective and it leads to an effective thermal conductivity of uh, superfluid helium, much higher than any other material. And for this reason, superfluid helium has been widely utilized as a coolant for cooling superconducting magnet and the particle accelerators. However, uh, when the relative speed of the two fluids exceeds a small critical value, it has been known that uh, turbulence can set in spontaneously in a superfluid as a tangle of quantized vortices. Um, then this tank of vortices can induce mutual friction between the two fluids, which impedes uh, the heat transfer and also leads to a lot of interesting uh, turbulence behavior. Um, due to the two fluid nature and the mutual friction, uh, there are a lot of interesting phenomena that can occur in counterflow turbulence. For instance, it has been observed that there are two turbulent states, the so-called T1 and the T2 state. In the T1 state, only the superfluid is turbulent. You have a tangle of quantized vortices, but the normal fluid is lamina. Then in the T2 state at high heat flux, both fluid can become turbulent. And then in this fully turbulent state, a uh, recent theoretical study suggests that there are a lot of uh, bizarre behavior. For instance, uh, such a turbulence becomes more uh, anisotropic at smaller scales, which is completely different from classical turbulence. And furthermore, it has been suggested that even in three-dimensional uh, counterflow turbulence, there could be an inverse energy cascade, 
which is a characteristic feature of two-dimensional turbulence. So there are a lot of interesting behavior. But to probe uh, the counterflow turbulence, we need some quantitative measurement tools. The challenge here is that many tools developed for classical turbulence flow are not applicable because we have two fluids and both fluids have independent velocity field and they both can contribute to the sensor response such as a pressure sensor. So as a consequence, it's very difficult to disentangle the contribution from the two fluid components. So we need the tools that allow independent quantitative measurement in a two fluid system. Um, another type of a flow that's also very interesting is the so-called quantum classical flow. Uh, this flow can be generated by mechanical forcing in superfluid helium. For instance, one can tow a grid or using some rotation object to generate a flow. In this mechanically generated flows, uh, the two fluids are believed to be strongly coupled together at scales greater than the vortex line spacing. As a consequence, the two fluid system can become a single fluid system with some effective viscosity. So in this case, they can exhibit classical features. And this actually gives rise to the potential for very high Reynolds number turbulence research, classical turbulence research, and the model testing, because the kinematic viscosity of the superfluid helium is the smallest. So in principle, one can generate flows with extremely high Reynolds number. However, uh, there are still a lot of uh, open questions. For instance, some people uh, does not believe this uh, strong coupling theory. Um, uh, they believe the coupling is not complete. And furthermore, at small scales, the two fluids must break up. Uh, the coupling uh, can no longer hold. And then in this region, the dissipation uh, could lead to uh, some modification of the uh, uh, turbulence behavior. So again, we need quantitative flow measurement to study the flow properties in quasi classical turbulence in, in, in superfluid heat. Um, another uh, temperature region is at a very low temperature below 0.6 K, where we don't have normal fluid. We simply just have a uh, superfluid. In this case, uh, the superfluid can still be uh, become turbulent. And then the uh, interesting question is, how does the turbulent energy decays in the absence of any viscosity? Uh, the general physical picture that has been accepted in this community is um, we may have, say, large-scale vortex loops, and then those large-scale vortex loops can break up into smaller and smaller loops. So the turbulent energy can cascade to smaller scales. And then as the energy gets to the scale comparable to the vortex line spacing, then a vortex reconnection can occur, and then the, the vortex, uh, vortex reconnection can generate waves on the quantized vortices, which we call it Kelvin waves. And then the energy can, uh, can further cascade down to smaller scales by Kelvin wave turbulence. So in the end, the energy can be emitted as quasi-particles like phonons. But I must point out that this physical picture is uh, essentially a theoretical. There's no experimental evidence. To study this uh, interesting uh, energy cascade, Essentially, we need to visualize quantized vortices at a very low temperature, and this has not yet been achieved in this community. So now I'm going to discuss the visualization technique uh, developed in uh, liquid helium. Over the past one decade, uh, there have been a lot of efforts in developing quantitative flow visualization technique for velocity field measurement in liquid helium. This includes the so-called particle imaging and the particle tracking velocimetry technique. Uh, my colleague, Steve Van Skyper, uh, was the first one who uh, developed and applied the particle imaging velocimetry technique to flow research in liquid helium. Uh, they tested various uh, trace particles, including polymer microspheres, glass beads, and in the end, they concluded or not. Uh, solidified hydrogen particles are better traces. So to produce those hydrogen traces, they make a mixture of hydrogen gas and the helium gas at room temperature, and then they inject the gas mixture directly into the helium. Upon the injection, the hydrogen essentially will condense and form ice particles uh, of several microns in diameter. Then they send in a laser sheet to illuminate the tracer particles, the hydrogen particles. And then based on the displacement of trace particles, uh, 
uh, in two images taken at a very short time separation, they can compute the velocity field in the entire two-dimensional space. So by using this method, they started various flows in the uh, Later, uh, Dan Lasrope at Maryland, in collaboration with Xirin Li uh, from New York University, they developed a technique called particle tracking velocimetry. Uh, essentially, they use the same type of uh, trace particles, hydrogen isotope ice particles. But instead of taking two images, they just took a movie. Um, to their surprise, they find that in a superfluid phase, they can easily observe some line structures like this. They uh, quickly realize that those line structures are essentially quantized vortices uh, decorated by those trace particles. Uh, the reason for that is because uh, when you have a solid trace particle nearby a quantized vortex line, uh, there is a Bernoulli pressure pushing the particle towards the vortex core. Um, uh, another way to understand this is when you put a particle on the quantized vortices, it actually displays uh, the fluid volume where the uh, flow of speed is very high, so the kinetic energy is high. When you displace this volume, essentially the total energy of the system decreases. So there's a binding energy for the particle to stay on, on the quantized vortices. So to this end, they can start a quantized vortex motion, and then they uh, use this technique to start it to uh, essentially uh, film uh, the motion of, uh, of vortices started a vortex reconnection and the Kelvin wave excitation. This very powerful method uh, quickly spread out to laboratories all over the world, including our lab. Um, so our original motivation is very simple. Um, actually, in the previous uh, study uh, by uh, Steve Vanskyber's group and the Maryland group, uh, they apply the PIV and the PTV technique to study uh, counterflow. Uh, it's quite interesting that in the, P in the PIV experiment, uh, the group uh, member, they find that the particles, their mean velocity is only one half the expected normal fluid velocity. Uh, they have thought that the particles should simply just follow the viscous normal fluid motion. But in the end, they observe that the mean velocity of the particle is only one half the normal fluid velocity. On the other hand, the Marinan group, they find that uh, at low heat flux, I mean, they conducted uh, their experiment in the relatively low heat flux region. They observed that at least for those particles not trapped on the quantized vortices, their mean speed agrees with the expected normal fluid velocity. So there's a discrepancy. To solve this discrepancy, uh, we decided to conduct our own um, PTV experiment so uh, in the following uh, slides, I will discuss uh, a new uh, analysis method we developed that can allow us to extract a very useful information in counterflow. And I will also very briefly mention uh, how we applied this method to study uh, quasi-classical turbulence generated by a tau degree in superfluid heat. So this is uh, the gas injection system uh, we fabricated. Uh, so essentially, it consists of a, a, a helium gas cylinder together with a hydrogen gas cylinder. Using this system, we can produce a gas mixture of uh, any mass ratio. So through extensive research, we have figured out the optimal injection parameter, like the uh, optimal uh, injection pressure, injection duration, and optimal uh, mixing ratio, such and such. So in the end, we can produce very nice trace particles. Then we build a transparent flow channel. We put a heater at the bottom of the channel to generate counterflow. So here is a typical movie taking our counterflow uh, PTV experiment. Those bright points are trace particles. So the heat flux is in the vertical up direction. So you can see many of the particles do follow the normal fluid motion, move together with uh, the normal fluid in the heat flux direction. But some of the particles uh, they actually can stop and then undergo random motion, and on average, they can be even moving downward. So we first analyzed the distribution of the particle uh, vertical velocity. We find that at low heat fluxes, the vertical velocity distribution exhibited two peaks. Um, for the peak at higher mean velocity, we call it a G2 group. Uh, those particles have relatively straight trajectories. They move straight up 
with the normal fluid. Uh, for the peak with lower mean velocity, we call it a G1 group. Uh, those particles have irregular trajectories. On average, they can even move in downward. Um, as the heat flux increases, we see that those two peaks gradually merge together. So we see those trajectories can switch from one type to another type. At sufficiently high heat flux, the two peaks becomes a single peak, and then all the particles simply behave uh, in the same way. They move upward, but uh, uh, their trajectory are not very straight. Uh, there are some uh, horizontal motion. Uh, in this region, we call, we call the uh, group as G3 group. Uh, we finally figure out that the G1 group is due to particles trapped on contact of the vortices. So that's why they have this irregular trajectory. And then the G2 group is essentially due to particles entrained by the normal fluid. They are not trapped. They are entrained by the viscous normal fluid. So that's why they move together with the normal fluid. And then uh, in the high heat flux region, all the particles, they just constantly undergo trapping detrapping because even for particles trapped on quantized vortices, they can easily be pulled off the vortices by the viscous drag force from the normal fluid. So all the particles simply undergo collision with quantized vortices. That's why we observe a single uh, peak. All the particles have the same behavior. So we started the mean velocity of the trace particles. It turns out that in the low heat flux region, where we observed the two peaks, uh, the G2 group uh, particle, they move with normal fluid, and their velocity indeed agrees with the expected normal fluid. But the G1 particles, those particles trapped on vortices, uh, they first move with the superfluid, uh, moves at a superfluid velocity. Essentially, they drift together with the quantized vortices. And then at relatively high, large heat flux, they, their velocity can increase with the applied heat flux. And this slope is about one half the expected normal fluid velocity. At high heat flux, all the peaks merge together, and then we have a single group. This single group essentially has a velocity more or less agree with one half the expected normal fluid velocity. So essentially, we resolved the discrepancy between the uh, traditional PIV and the PTV experiment. Uh, those two experiments was, uh, were essentially uh, conducted in different heat flux region. The, P the PIV experiment uh, was conducted in a high heat flux region. So that's why they only observed the one half of Vn for the particle velocity. And then for the PTV experiment, uh, that was conducted at low heat flux. So that's why those group of people, they observed the untrapped particles do move with the normal fluid. Um, since we observed that the, there are two groups, um, we decided to focus on this low heat flux region where the normal fluid is lamina. And so, uh, so we uh, analyzed the two, the two groups separately and hope to uh, produce more quantitative information. First, we analyzed the motion of the G2 group. Um, those particles are essentially uh, entrained by the normal fluid. Um, we imagine that those particles will need to move through the quantized uh, vortex tangle. So there is a mean free path for the particles to go through uh, the vortices before it gets trapped by a vortex line. Uh, based on simple dimensional argument, we can link the mean free path uh, uh, to the quantized vortex line density. So when the density is high, definitely the mean free path will be small. When the vortex line density is low, then the mean free path through the tangle will be long. So then we measured the track lens for the G2 particles. That track lens averaged together can give us information about the mean free path of the particles goes, going through the quantized vortices. So through this relation, then we can determine the vortex line density. So we conducted this measurement, and we also measured the quantized vortex line density using the standard second sound attenuation method. It turns out that the two methods gives uh, result in good agreement with the So the PTV visualization method not only allow us to probe the flow uh, field, get velocity field information, but can only but can also allow us to measure the quantized vortex density in superfluid heat. So this is uh, the new information we can get from the PTV uh, measurement. This work has been uh, 
uh, selected as the editor suggestion. Um, we also observed that, that those uh, G2 particles moving with the laminar normal fluid exhibit a quite strong velocity fluctuation in the heat flux direction, but not in the horizontal direction. Uh, this is quite uh, puzzling because we have evidence to show that normal fluid at a very low heat flux is laminar. And then the question is, how could the particle move together with the normal fluid has very strong velocity fluctuation only in the heat flux direction? Okay, And the, remember, the normal fluid is laminar. There shouldn't be any velocity fluctuation. It turns out that this observation is related to a very interesting uh, phenomenon. That is the mutual friction. So when the normal fluid pass across a quantized vortices, say here we, we have a vortex line which goes into the board. Then when the normal, normal fluid pass across this vortex line, the mutual friction can generate some vague, some wake structure behind the vortices. Then in the region where the uh, vortex line density is high, those wake structures can add up together and form coherent large scale structures. Those large scale structures essentially align along the heat flux direction. And that's the reason why we can observe a relatively strong velocity fluctuation in the heat flux direction. This physical, physical picture has been confirmed in our numerical simulation. Uh, we find that indeed uh, the vortices can, uh, can generate uh, uh, vorticity structure in the normal fluid. And then those uh, structure uh, essentially can add up to form coherent uh, structures, which lead to relatively large velocity fluctuation. And this velocity fluctuation is uh, much stronger in the heat flux direction, in good agreement with our observ uh, observation. Yeah. So um, after we analyzed the uh, untrapped G2 particle, we decided to analyze the trapped G1 particle, those particles trapped on vortices. Um, their trajectory are quite irregular, pretty much like a random worker. So uh, we decided to analyze the diffusion behavior. Specifically, we calculated the mean square displacement of those trapped G1 particles. Uh, we know that uh, the mean square displacement in principle should scale with time as a power law. And this power function, if it's less than one, it's called subdiffusion. If it equals to one, uh, it's uh, called normal diffusion. And if the, this power index is greater than one, uh, it's called super diffusion. Uh, furthermore, uh, we know that um, the, uh, at, low, uh, at sufficiently low heat flux, the particles trapped on quantized vortices, they don't really move along the vortex lines. And there's an explanation for that. So essentially, we believe by tracking the apparent diffusion of the trapped particles, we can get information about how quantized vortices diffuse around in a vortex tank. So we measured the mean square displacement of the vortices. Uh, it's interesting that we, we find at relatively uh, low uh, diffusion time, we observed a super diffusion with a power index of a 1.6. And then at a relatively large diffusion time, uh, this diffusion scaling switched to something close to a normal diffusion gamma equals to one. Uh, so we made this type of a measurement at a lot of heat fluxes and different temperatures. It turns out that we always observe those two diffusion uh, uh, regions. And in the super diffusion region, the power index is always around 1.5 to 1.6. And then in the normal diffusion region, the power index is close to one. And, and we also measured this critical uh, transition scale uh, so the diffusion switches from the super diffusion region to the normal diffusion region. It turns out that this diffusion uh, region, this diffusion scale, uh, agrees quite well with uh, the vortex line spacing. So this means that we have super diffusion uh, for the quantized vortices when their displacement is less than the uh, mean uh, vortex separation. But then when their displacement is greater than the mean vortex line separation, uh, the diffusion can switch to normal diffusion behavior. So the question is, why? Why do we have such an interesting behavior? Um, indeed, there are a lot of uh, super diffusion uh, behavior observed in the physical systems and the biological systems. It has been known that for random workers, the super diffusion is caused by uh, 
uh, long distance hops, which is the so-called levy flight events. Uh, those levy uh, flight events essentially uh, leads to uh, power law uh, tails for the displacement and distribution. And it requires that uh, this power law tail must be flatter than x to the minus three in order to have super diffusion behavior. Interestingly, um, the quantized vortices, if you check their uh, displacement, uh, we also observed sometime, we also observed the long distance uh, hopping events. And we understand that those uh, hopping events is essentially caused by vortex reconnection, because during vortex reconnection, uh, the particle can have very high speed. So that's why uh, occasionally we can observe this uh, long distance hopping behavior. But when we check the displacement distribution, we find that uh, they also lead to power law tails, but the power index uh, is much lower than minus three. So that means the tail is uh, not flat enough to give rise to super diffusion behavior. This means uh, in the end, uh, super diffusion is not caused by levy flight, okay? Um, on the other hand, super diffusion can still emerge if uh, the particles are not completely random. For instance, uh, say their velocity exhibit a temporal correlation. One can easily derive that the mean square displacement is linked to velocity temporal correlation through this formula. So if the velocity correlation has a power law behavior, say t to the minus beta's power, then through this uh, relation, one can easily derive that the mean square displacement must scale as t to the two minus beta. So uh, there could be apparent super diffusion behavior as caused by velocity correlation. So we measure the velocity correlation for our trace particle. It turns out that indeed uh, at the observed uh, super diffusion uh, time region, where there is uh, nearly a power law behavior and the power index uh, beta is about 0 .4. If you plug this value in this formula, you will see the expected uh, mean square displacement uh, should be t to the two minus 0.4. So essentially t to the 1.6 power. That's exactly what we observed. So we believe that uh, the super diffusion of the quantized vortices is caused by essentially the temporal velocity correlation of the quantized vortices. This uh, uh, power law uh, correlation, velocity correlation behavior was not known in the past. So this is something new as we reported in this paper. Uh, recently, we conducted a numerical simulation using Biosavart, uh, Biosavart uh, uh, vortex Feynman method. And we started a vortex diffusion in thermal counterflow. And indeed, we observed exactly what we observed, uh, what we seen, what we saw in the experiment. So at a short time scale, uh, the quantized vortices undergo super diffusion. And when their displacement is greater than uh, the mean vortex line spacing, they switch to the normal diffusion behavior. So essentially this physical picture is confirmed. Um, then we also applied our PTV uh, technique to study a quartz classical turbulence generated by uh, a Tauda grid. So we built a grid system and use a motor to tell the grid to generate a turbulent flow in this uh, transparent channel. And here is a typical movie. Um, as we tell the grid, you can see the particle move around, uh, but the behavior is quite different from that in counterflow because in this case, all the particles simply move randomly. Uh, there's no uh, you know, apparent uh, separation of the two groups. There's only, uh, uh, you know, all the particles have very similar behaviors essentially. Um, so I'll skip this part, uh, the detailed analysis. I just wanted to mention to you that now we can uh, make very quantitative, uh, quantitative study of the velocity field, calculate, it, calculate structure function and energy spectrum, such and such. It's still on, ongoing work. Uh, we can get a lot of uh, quantitative information about quartz classical turbulence in superfluid here. Uh, now let me uh, quickly introduce uh, another uh, visual, visualization technique. As I mentioned, the uh, PTB technique is very useful, but uh, when heat flux is too high, then the particles can spontaneously in interact with both the viscous normal fluid component and quantized vortices 
uh, which render their motion very difficult to interpret. So the question is, is there a way uh, so we can track uh, one fluid component at a time? The answer is yes, if we use very small molecular traces. So here the trace particle we use is the so-called uh, metastable helium molecules. We know that two ground state helium atoms, when they meet together, they will not bind together to form molecules. This is because the interaction potential energy uh, uh, decreases as the two particles move away from each other. However, if one ground state helium atom is excited to a high energy state, then the interaction potential curve will change. There is a potential energy minimum where the excited uh, atom can stay together with a ground state atom and then form a metastable mark. Um, depend on the uh, uh, out shell electron spin, the metastable molecule could be in spin singlet state or in the triplet state. Singlet molecule can easily decay to the ground state. Um, their lifetime is very short, about one nanosecond, so they are not particularly useful. But the triplet molecule, their decay to the ground state requires a spin flip, which is forbidden. So their lifetime can be extremely long. It has been measured to be about 13 seconds. So they can be treated as uh, trace particles. Furthermore, those particles can be easily produced in liquid helium by either ionization or excitation of uh, ground state helium atoms. So one can use, say, strong laser light, field ionization, or radioactive source. Then you can essentially produce a lot of uh, trace molecules. What's more important is that those trace molecules are very small. They form tiny bubbles in liquid helium with a radius of about six angstroms. So above one Kelvin, uh, they are completely entrained by the viscous normal fluid. They don't interact with the contacts of the vortices. Only at a temperature below 0.5K, when there's no normal component, then the molecule bubble can bind it to the contacts of the vortices for a very long time. And then essentially that can be used for uh, vortex line visualization in very low temperature. Um, to visualize the uh, molecule tracer, um, uh, laser-induced fluorescence technique has been developed. Essentially, one can use two photons at 905 nanometer to excite the molecules in a triplet ground state to the high energy D state. From there, the molecule will decay to the intermediate B state by emitting a red photon at 640 nanometer. And then from there, they quench back to the triplet ground state. So the second transition can be uh, excited for uh, many times, so every molecule can produce a lot of uh, uh, fluorescence photons. We have tested this fluorescence technique uh, in the past and successfully imaged uh, those molecules and used those molecules to probe the flow. Especially in recent years, we developed a very powerful molecular tagging velocity technique. The concept is that we use a femtosecond laser, focus it, and pass it through a liquid helium. In the focal region, the laser intensity is so high such that it can ionize thin atoms along the laser beam. So essentially, we can create a very thin line of tracer particles. By uh, focusing the beam, we can easily control the length and the thickness of the trace line. And then by allowing the trace line to move together with a normal fluid, say above one Kelvin, and then essentially we can calculate the normal fluid velocity based on the local deformation displacement of the trace line. So this is a quantitative method that allows us to measure the normal fluid flow. We have applied this method to study thermal counterflow. Uh, essentially, by turning on a heater, we create a tracer, turning on a heater, and then observe how this trace line deforms. Uh, when there's no heat flux, we simply have a straight trace line. At very, very small heat flux, a straight trace line deforms into a parabolic shape which suggests a laminar flow in the normal fluid. Then as we gradually increase the heat flux, very interestingly, we observe this tail flattened profile. Uh, in this heat flux region, the normal fluid is still laminar because uh, this velocity profile is highly reproducible. So uh, this is a new phenomenon. And then at uh, even higher heat flux, we observe a random deformation of the trace line which is suggests fully turbulent flow in the normal fluid. Um, this tail flattened laminar uh, velocity profile uh, does not exist in classical channel flow. So uh, it generated a lot of interest in the community. 
Uh, so following our work, there are a lot of uh, numerical theoretical study of this uh, uh, tail flat and uh, laminar flow velocity profile. It turns out that in the laminar flow, uh, there are a lot of vortices accumulating the uh, channel wall. So in the channel wall region, uh, the mutual friction between the two fluids is so strong such that it can uh, modify the laminar normal fluid profile and change the profile to this uh, tail flat and the structure. And we also applied our uh, uh, technique to, the, to measure the velocity, uh, the velocity structure function and the energy spectrum in a fully turbulent flow. Uh, so we did a lot of uh, quantitative characterization of the fully turbulent flow uh, in, 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 in counterflow turbulence. It turns out that the normal fluid turbulence in counterflow indeed is quite noble. It has completely different uh, statistical property compared to uh, say classical channel flow with water. Uh, for details, please check those papers. Uh, now let me very briefly mention another application of this uh, visualization technique. We also applied it to some practical problems. Essentially that's related to the so-called quench spot detection for accelerator cavities. Nowadays, a lot of uh, uh, particle accelerator are made of uh, superconducting radio frequency cavities. So those cavities uh, can be cooled by liquid helium and then charged with high electromagnetic field. So uh, the particles can move through those connected cavities and be accelerated to very high speed. But the maximum acceleration field is limited by quenching of the cavity caused by dual heating from very small surface defects. So an uh, important R&D effort in this field is to develop a method to detect those surface defects so one can uh, remove the defect and improve the performance of the cavity. It's actually very, very important because if you think about the cost of uh, a particle accelerator, even 10% increment of the maximum acceleration field uh, means a lot of money. So this is a very, very important uh, um, uh, topic. So our idea is um, we wanted to create a trace line and uh, on top of the uh, uh, the hot spot on the solid surface in liquid helium, and then the hot spot will generate a heat. The heat can deform the trace line, and then based on the relative position between the trace line and the hot spot, uh, the trace line will deform into different shape. So by observing the deformation, one should then be able to determine uh, the hot spot. So we conducted a, a, a proof of concept experiment. We used a very tiny uh, resistive heater mounted on a plate in superfluid helium, and then we create a trace line on top of it. It turns out that, yes, we can observe the line deformation, and then based on this line deformation, we can calculate the position of the, uh, uh, the hotspot. It turns out that the uh, position we calculated uh, it's always uh, always agree with the, with the actual position of the heater within a few hundred microns. This resolution is already far better than any existing uh, uh, um, quench spot detection method. So later we developed a stereoscopic uh, molecular tagging uh, setup. We use two uh, cameras so we can observe the deformation of the trace line in three dimensional space. As a consequence, we can, we can then locate the hot spot in three-dimensional space. Uh, the result, again, uh, shows that uh, we can determine the center of the heater within a few hundred microns uh, to the actual center. So this is, again, uh, far better than existing method. Uh, this work has generated a lot of interest among the uh, particle accelerator physicists, and um, uh, especially, uh, the, the Department of Energy uh, supported us to develop a, a in-house user facility. Essentially, in the future, we wanted to create a, a trace align grid and then mount the cavity on a, rotat on a rotatable uh, mount so we can scan the surface of the cavity and then find all the uh, quench spots. Okay, uh, the last of the two slides. I'd like to mention that um, uh, there's ongoing uh, development. We wanted to develop uh, the next generation of flow visualization technique. Um, as you see, uh, the molecular tagging velocity technique, uh, essentially we, we create a single trace line so uh, we can measure the velocity along this uh, single vortex line. 
but this does not provide us information about the velocity field in the whole three-dimensional space or two-dimensional space. So the question is, is there possible to use the molecules to do particle tracking or particle imaging velocity, uh, velocity measurement? The answer is yes. Essentially, we need to create a lot of a small cloud of helium molecules and then treat each cloud as a single trace. Then we can do particle tracking or particle imaging velocity, velocity measurement. To create those clouds, uh, the idea is to use neutron helium-3 reaction. For each neutron helium-3 reaction, essentially two energetic particles will be created in liquid helium. Uh, those two energetic particles will propagate uh, in liquid helium and uh, ionized helium atoms create a lot of molecules. The track length is about 80 microns. So essentially for each helium-3 uh, neutron absorption reaction, we will get a cloud, a small cloud of helium molecules with a cloud size about uh, 100 microns. So an experiment I can imagine is in a liquid helium field cell, we can dope it with a small amount of helium-3 atoms and then send in a neutron beam. As a consequence of this uh, neutron helium-3 reaction, we can get a lot of a small cloud of helium molecules. And then we can send in the lasers to visualize and track those small helium mo molecule cloud. As a consequence, then we can make traditional PIV or PTV measurement. We can get the complete velocity field. Um, I wanted to mention to you that um, uh, so far two collaboration have been uh, established and some uh, preliminary experiment have been conducted. Those experiments both suggest that the helium molecules can indeed be produced by this neutron helium-3 absorption reaction. And specifically in uh, this report, uh, we conducted experiment by sending in the neutron beam and then uh, also the, uh, sending in the laser and put a camera there. Um, uh, it turns out that when the neutron is on, we can observe the fluorescent signal and we can really get image of the uh, small cloud. For more details, uh, please check uh, those reports. All right, so that's essentially the end of my talk. I also wanted to mention that we have a postdoc position opening. If anyone is interested, please feel free to contact me. Um, okay, that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Wei. That was a wonderful talk. Um, Thank you. The floor is now open for questions. And I wonder if... Uh, if there are any questions, I do have a couple of questions. Uh, sure, go ahead. To ask. Mm -hmm. So I'll probably start while others are warming up. Um, so firstly, towards the beginning, you mentioned about the tracer particles, these G1 particles going at exactly 0.5 of the normal fluid velocity. So what's the significance of this 0.5? I mean, where do you get this from? Why would it be 0.5? I understand that it will be lower because. Uh, uh, yeah, that's a very good question. And um, uh, 0.5 is probably uh, a coincidence. Um, there are numerical study which shows that uh, in the end, the uh, particle velocity is more or less 0.5. Uh, it's essentially due to uh, frequent collision of the particles on quantized vortices. And then once the particle gets on the vortices, they can be pulled off by the viscous normal fluid, and then they collide with the quantized vortices again. So this uh, continuous collision in the end leads to uh, a lower velocity, and it happens to be about 0.5, not exactly 0.5 indeed. Okay, okay, that's the, yeah. okay, fine, fine, great. Okay, Apurva, you have a question. Why don't you go ahead? I have a few more for Wei. Uh, Apurva, you are muted. Your hand is raised. Apurva? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. I have uh, a very simple question. You described the flow of liquid helium using this uh, two fluid model. Um, and that is quite uh, fine. But the liquid helium spectrum has uh, rotons also as excitations. So where do the roton dynamics enter into this description? 
Um, okay, let me go back to my slides. Um, so I mentioned it at the very beginning. Uh, here, I think. Yeah. So I mentioned it at the very beginning. Um, the quasi the particles, uh, they can be regarded as the normal fluid component. Well, essentially, you can uh, regard the quasi particles like a roton, phonon, as, say, uh, particles with momentum. So this is pretty much like air molecules, you know, bouncing back and forth in a room. Okay. So your quasi particles essentially uh, also carry uh, momentum and it can bounce it back and forth in your container. So collectively, uh, they can be treated as a viscous normal fluid component because they can exchange momentum with moving object uh, in the container. So that's pretty much like, you know, in a room filled with air, you move some object and then there's a viscous uh, interaction between your object and the surrounding air. So the same thing occurs in superfluid helium. The moving object can have the interaction, momentum exchange with the quasi particles. Okay. Okay. Uh, does that answer your question, Apurva? Your hand is still raised. It's fine. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, okay, Yogendra, you have a question. You are. Oh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Please. I have a, uh, I must congratulate the speaker, Professor Ray, for uh, a very wonderful journey of uh, experimental work uh, in the field of turbulence. And as a mechanical engineer, I'm very, very proud that you are working in the mechanical engineering department at uh, FIDA. So uh, <laughs> congratulations again. My question is, uh, you, Thank you. Uh, very mm -hmm. nicely brought out the interplay between G1 and G2 species in a, in a situation like a two-phase flow. I was wondering if uh, the G1 species is just moving around without getting coupled with G2, then is there a particular uh, reason why there should not be some temperature fluctuations which is driving these fluctuations in velocity? Or do you think these temperature fluctuations are not, not terribly important for your physics? Within the um, uh, okay, uh, so, sorry, uh, Ambrish, can you repeat the question? Because uh, it's a bit uh, interrupted somehow. I'm sorry, there is yeah. a lot of rain, <laughs> rain's coming down here. Let me repeat it once again. My question is, do you think the temperature fluctuations inside the flow field? Uh, temperature getting, fluctuation? Yes, uh, are they getting close to the critical point? So, uh, in, in some sense, uh, in a local way, which is making the G1, G2 separate in the velocity Fields you showed G G1 is having a negative velocity going on in all directions, but G2 seems to be only going in one direction. So I was wondering if you can throw some light on uh, local temperature fluctuations. Oh, I see what you mean. Uh, okay, okay. Um, first of all, uh, if you evaluate the uh, temperature gradient in superfluid healing counterflow, you will see the temperature gradient is extremely small. And uh, this is essentially because the very high thermal conductivity, apparent thermal conductivity. So we normally don't really care much about temperature fluctuation in counterflow. Now, uh, when you uh, when you ask why the G1 particle they uh, can have say negative velocity and then switch to uh, a positive velocity, that's a very very good question. Uh, the understanding is this: um, essentially, the particles, the G1 particles, they are trapped on quantized vortices. The quantized vortex tangle at low heat flux, they essentially drift together with the superfluid component. The superfluid moves in opposite direction towards the heater. So on average, the tangle also drifts at a negative velocity towards the heater. So that's why initially those particles trapped on vortices, they move together with the tangle towards the heater, having a negative velocity. But then as the heat flux increases, you can imagine the normal fluid moves faster and faster. As a consequence, the viscous drag force from the normal fluid becomes larger and larger. So that drag force acting on both the quantized vortices and the tracer particles, in the end, they can even stop the drifting of the quantized vortices. So the tangle may have a mean velocity that is equal to zero, or at a sufficient high heat fluxes, the vortices, the vortex tangle, can drift towards the positive direction but definitely at a much lower velocity. And it happens that this low velocity is about one half 
the normal fluid velocity. Okay, thank you very so much. And I have just one more uh, uh, clarification. You mentioned the dimer uh, molecule of uh, helium, uh, excimer molecules are about five angstroms uh, uh, across. Is that right? Yeah, about six angstroms. You raised six angstroms. So, but yeah. the pictures you showed are so really brilliant pictures. I was wondering whether uh, if it were only five or six angstroms, we must be having a whole lot of uh, these dimers to project an image. So I'm just wondering in each of those images, how many dimers you think the minimum number of dimers are required to give a good image? Oh yeah, that's yeah, that's that's a very very good question. Um, I I think uh, in principle with very good uh, optics and very large light collection angle. Say for instance, you put your camera uh, very close to uh, the healing cell, in principle, one can detect a single photon and one can detect a uh, single molecules. But in our experiment, we, we happen to push towards the less limiting situation. Our camera is far outside the uh, cryostate. So we, we can only image a large cloud uh, of molecules. But I can tell you uh, at the moment, our limit is about uh, several thousand molecules, say two, three thousand molecules in a cloud. And then with our light collection, solid angle, such and such, we can uh, produce a relatively good quality images. Yeah. Thank you for a very wonderful, outstanding contribution to the field. Thank you again. Thank you. We, I had one last uh, one or two questions, just two more questions. Sure, go ahead. Uh, uh, one question was you mentioned about this vortex velocity correlation. And the yep. time there you mentioned was, you know, it was super diffusive till about a time of 100 milliseconds or so. You had mentioned, in, at least in the data you had shown. Yeah, uh, I think the slight number. So I wonder uh, on what does this autocorrelation uh, depend on? So, so for example, would it would it would it change if you had re reduced or increased the vortex line density? So. What are the causes of this autocorrelation? Yeah, what uh, this is a, yeah, th this is a very good question. Um, we recently are working very actively on, on this topic. And uh, uh, essentially, um, we did a lot of uh, numerical simulation at a different uh, what excellent density, different temperatures, such and such. It turns out that uh, this velocity correlation is uh, quite intrinsic. It, it's a consequence of the, uh, the Biot-Savart law. It's the first order consequence of the Bio Sabata law. So it only depends on the local velocity and how the nearby uh, vortex uh, segment affects uh, the segment of interest. So in the end, that you can imagine you have a vortex angle and every vortex segment just move around. And the reason they move around is because the nearby vortices and also itself can induce some flow speed and uh, the vortices has to move, move at the local superfluid velocity. So that's essentially why there exists such a velocity correlation. I think this velocity correlation is uh, due to the bio savart law. Uh, we, we can show this numerically, but I think it should be possible to derive it analytically, you know, based on uh, bio savart law, a theoretical derivation, but we haven't achieved that. So, so far we only perform a numerical simulation. Yeah. Okay, great, great. Um, my another, okay, I think Sanjay has one more question. Sanjay, go ahead, please. Yeah, can you hear me, sir? Hello? Yeah, I can. So this is about this uh, super diffusion where you plotted this mean square displacement. So you have a super diffusion and then this normal diffusion. But usually when we plot this del x square, so we also have this uh, power law with 0.5 for a very large uh, time. Um, at a very large time, um, essentially we have a normal diffusion. Yes, the um, mean square displacement uh, scales as time to the first power, right? And but also, uh, the reason- mm -hmm. But we also get inertial range is the T to power 0.5, uh, where the correlations are not so strong. So, uh, uh, 0.5. Okay, but I cannot see here. Uh, maybe it's a uh, time scale is not too large. Uh, which slides are you talking about? Uh, 
It's a delta square plot. So it's a mean square displacement. The one and versus is the. Is the this, is this list slide? Oh, in the paper. Oh, you oh, you, re you read the paper. Oh, okay. Um, um, I I don't quite I I, I don't quite know. Um, for the velocity correlation, uh, we measured the um, uh, uh, we measured the power law scaling. Uh, about 0.4 that corresponded to a super diffusion scaling of 1.6 t sort of 1.6 then at a large time essentially what we observed for the velocity correlation is the correlation uh, uh, rapidly dropped down this rapid drop is necessary for the appearance of normal diffusion so that uh, indeed agrees with the observed normal diffusion at a large time scale Oh, okay, okay. One more question. This uh, super diffusion is basically mainly because of this vortex reconnections or any other reason? No, we, we believe it's not caused by uh, reconnection because the reconnection does not have enough statistics, does not contribute enough statistics. And our uh, theory is it's not, it's not caused by reconnection, but instead it's caused by velocity correlation of individual uh, vortex segment. Each vortex is they, they do not move randomly uh, from one time to the next time. Uh, the, their velocity has some temporal correlation. So that's why they appear to move uh, relatively fast. Yeah, okay. Thank you, thank you, sir. Okay. Yeah, sure, my pleasure. Way I had one last question. Okay, this, sure. uh, the tail flattening profile that you had shown, uh, how does it uh, uh, look when you make your channel really narrow? Could you ever do that experiment? Does it? Oh, um, yeah, that, that's a very, very good question. I, I must uh, uh, tell you, um, actually, I, I mentioned that the T1, T2 state. So uh, um, uh, it, 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 it has been known in this field that the T1 to T2 transition uh, can be observed only in relatively large channels. So in that case, you can observe this T1 to T2 transition. But then when the channel is too small, too narrow, uh, or I mean, when when you say have two plates, uh, in that case, there's only a, a single transition directly to the fully turbulent state. So uh, it's imagine that when you make the channel size smaller and smaller, probably uh, you know the boundary layer will be sort of pushed together. You you uh, you know in our channel we have a lot of vortices near the channel wall, but when you push the channel wall too close to each other. Uh, those vortex layer probably will overlap, and you may no longer have this uh, very nice tail flattened profile. You may have a different velocity profile, but we haven't got a chance to check that. And it's probably, um, I think it's possible to do such experiment, but we just don't know how small this channel needs to be. If it has to be, say, uh, 100 microns, then it would be challenging for us. Yeah, oh, understood. Thank you, Wei. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, sure. My pleasure. Ambarish, there is a question in the chat box. Oh, I see. I didn't check that. Okay, Rajiv uh, Singler Ramesh says, in all the videos that were shown, were all the visualizations done using laser fluorescence or with fluorescence of tracer particles? What are the right. other techniques employed for visualizing such quantum flows? Oh, and not always uh, fluorescence. The fluorescence is especially uh, applicable to molecular traces. For those large micron-sized frozen hydrogen ice particles, we don't need any fluorescence. We're just sending a light. The light will be scattered from the particles, uh, and then one can easily image the, those particles because they are large, like micron size. But for the angstrom-sized molecules, you have to use the fluorescence technique to uh, drive the molecule to produce fluorescent light because scattering light is too small. There's no, there's essentially no scattering at all. So those are essentially two different ways to visualize the tracer particle in superfluid here. Great. Thank you, Wei. Um, sure, my pleasure. Are there any other questions? Okay. Okay, well, actually, that was an extremely engaging talk. We wonderful work, Thank of you. course.
Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I think uh, since there are no other questions, uh, let us thank the speakers using the emojis <laughs> that we do these days, and then subsequently we can close the session. Great. Thank you again, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. I think we'll close the session now. Okay. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, Wei. Talk to you Bye, soon. Bye, Bye.